Well, welcome here tonight um, for the session for the NZID um, Professional Development Workshops, the first one for the year. Um, so we, what we're going to look at tonight is a question I've been asked a few times to share some ideas on, which is training driving instructors, training them with dual controls or how to use dual controls. And so I'll be able to share with you um, my 40 years of experience of uh, running a driving school and having lots of different instructors. And um, it's always been my policy with my driving school to actually have uh, dual controls in the vehicle. So the, que the question is, you know, what are dual controls? Well, they're the duplication of the driver's pedals onto the instructor's side of the vehicle and are usually directly connected and operate to those pedals. Um, just some general considerations, you know, that um, a lot of people don't put in the um, uh, accelerator pedal um, or don't duplicate all the pedals. You just have a brake pedal and things like that. My advice to you is put the whole lot in. And I'll, I'll share those ideas of why you do it further down the track. As far as certification goes, as long as you don't tap into the original braking equipment is what I understand is why you don't need to certify them. But if you drill holes in the brake pedals in the passenger uh, driver's side or uh, modify those pedals in any way, then they need to be certified because obviously you can weaken the pedals and things like that. Um, when you go for a warrant of fitness, um, they will test these controls. Uh, they will check that the brake, I think it's it's not got to have um it, it's it's not gonna have braking to the capacity that you would from the driver's side. So as long as it's um it, it, it's effective. Um reason why they test them at warrant of fitness time, there have been some incidents where people have made and fitted up their own dual controls and things like that. And uh, I record one incident that I heard of, I don't know if it's true or not, where they went, the um, person was driving on the motorway, they struck applied the brake and they couldn't get the brake back off, which obviously caused a bit of mayhem uh, being able to get the car out of the way and somehow get it unlocked. So they will check it at warrant of fitness times. But as I say, my understanding is you don't need them to be certified. Okay, so... Um, where do you get these dual controls uh, in, in, for your driving school car? Well, I've got one advert here, which I, um, the uh, advertiser has very kindly said that I can, uh, Ralph said I can use this advert. Uh, you can, if you look on the internet, uh, there's lots of places where you can actually get them. You get them from the UK, get them from Australia, get them all over the place. And in the past, I've purchased from Australia, England, um, but I like Ralph, but... <laughs> Um, he's uh, he's pretty good on the stuff and he'll supply the kits. He'll even have the accelerator kit. Some of the controls you get from the UK and that don't have an accelerator kit or don't have accelerators. So um, I found Australia and New Zealand um, with Fish of Ralph here. Um, he can supply those kits and that for you. So um, it is just another uh, good supplier out there that you can buy them off him. And you can see his prices there, which is about what you'd normally pay for a set of dual controls anyway. Um, advantage with Ralph, of course, I'm sorry, uh, I'm going on a bit about Ralph, but I've brought a bit of product from him. It's just the quickness of his delivery. I've, I've known Ralph to have these things to me almost overnight. So um, just a bit of a punt for you there, Ralph, if you ever see this, it's a, um, I found the service to be particularly good. Right, so next is... Um, who can fit my dual controls to my car? Well, if you live near the place where you purchase the controls, they often have a kind of a fitting service and you can get them to fit the controls. Um, but if you don't, um, they are fairly basic to fit and they come with the instructions and that. And you probably can get your local garage. I've, I've known to be able to take them into a local garage. Some will tackle it, some won't. Um, so if you can get your, um, I know that in Wellington here, for example, um, if you go to any of the dealerships, they'll usually have someone there that can actually fit up the dual controls for you. So um, uh, especially if you've got a, a person who currently services your car and you think if uh, they put them in, then they'll know uh, if the problem goes wrong, like occasionally they may break a cable or something like that, then they'll be able to repair it for you as well. So that's where I'd suggest you, you go for your fitting. Okay, so dual control training. So... 
do you need to have all your pedals duplicated? Well, some instructors, as I say, only use the brake pedal to duplicate it so they can stop the car. But I would strongly suggest that you duplicate all the pedals. Now, uh, you'll notice when I'm talking about all the pedals here, we don't usually duplicate the steering wheel. You can just reach across and get hold of that. Um, otherwise, um, you'll not be able to take advantage of some of the benefits of having a full set of dual controls. And over the years, um, 40 years, I've been training people and, and driving cars, mainly started on manual in the beginning, so you had all three pedals, more so automatic in these days with just the two pedals. Um, you'll see that as we go through, I'll be talking about things like dual driving. And dual driving is um, uh, can actually alleviate a lot of stress on your clients. Um, some people don't believe that you should touch the things unless you, you know, doing uh, it's an emergency or things like that. I, I believe they be, they're actually a teaching tool as well. And they, they can hugely cut down your stress levels and if, because it gives you a unique type of approach where I'll share that with you, how you can get people to um, just steer the car, for example, on the first lesson. So can focus on individual um, controls of the vehicle and be able to learn them piece by piece. Reduces the stress, huge. Okay, so, so some of the advantages of having a full set of dual controls then are the instructor can intervene with the dual controls, keep themselves safe, the student safe and the vehicle safe. So we're talking health and safety here. You can write this into your health and safety policy. Uh, over the years, I, I with all the, I've been run a team of about eight instructors over the forty years I've been, and I tell you, this, these have saved the day so many times. As a matter of fact, some insurance companies, as I'll go on to down further, they actually give you a reduction in your insurance premium to have them in the vehicle. So they can help keep control in stressful situations uh, for the student and the instructor. So lowering stress levels on your driving lessons. So they can be a more pleasant experience for your students. They can help with demonstrating the uh, skills to the student without having to change seats all the time to do this. So um, in a lot of the uh, Documents you'll get over, you'll change seats, the instructor will demonstrate, which is part of the LSFDI training, you'll demonstrate and explain what's going on, then you've got to get out of that seat, the student's got to get across into that seat, and then, but with dual controls, you can demonstrate the whole thing from the left side of the car. Now, if you need to get out the car for more exercise, because you're sitting around, sitting in a car for eight hours a day, then that's fine, you know, but... Um, I found that these things here are great for demonstration. Uh, some insurance companies will give you lowered premiums or excesses on the insurance. I know that uh, with Crombie Lockwood, if you're an Institute, institute of Driver Educators um, instructor, they will, they if you get the policy through uh, them, they will reduce the, the, the excess for the student if they crashes down to $500 you know, whereas you're normally paying up more towards $1,000. So um, I know state insurance, uh, they didn't used to, uh, the, the premiums were so astronomically high that you, with the dual controls in there was only the way you would probably ever insure with them. So think about some of those advantages. And if you're not currently using dual controls in your car, as you can see, it's going to cost you another, what, $1,000, $1,500 to have them fitted to your car. You're missing out on all these benefits for your students. Okay, so dual control training. So we're getting into this now. So you have your driving school car now and you've had your dual controls fitted and it's time to learn how to use them. So this is an exercise I do with all my driving instructors in the driving school. And I'll I'll go through the, the ideas and that of why I've hit on this method over the years. So the first exercise to, is to do is to put a competent driver in the driver's seat, not a learner, but a competent driver. You know, you're talking about um, one of your peers uh, that um, is an instructor or something like that, or in, in the case of myself, I, I'd, it'd be myself doing the training in the school and I'm a well, hopefully a competent driver and my student uh, is going to be the trainee instructor. The right or the new instructor. 
So the first thing is to get that confident, uh, I'm that confident driver in the driver's seat. So I, I, I sort of know how the whole thing's going to work and, and things like that. So probably the person who's doing the training, if you haven't got anyone to help you with the training, then um, you can still do this exercise, but um, put someone competent in the driver's seat and show them what you're up to and and see if you can get yourself confident with it. I think it's really important before you take any students out that if you're a new instructor that you actually do this exercise and, I, and as I say, I'll go through the reasons as we go through. So once we've got that in there, and uh, so if you, basically it's in case you have any problems with the dual controls or what you, it, it's a bit of a weird feeling when you first start to drive from that left-hand side. So uh, if you have any problems, they can just take over the driver. All right, so that that it is like a safeguard. Now, I don't advocate that you drive around the town because you can drive from the left side of the car. That you go driving around the town and you don't ever get get out of your, your instructor's seat because there is. Um, I, I think that wouldn't be a very professional thing to do. If you're going to be driving yourself, get yourself in the driver's seat. Okay, dual control training here. So go to some quiet streets. You've got the two of you in the car and learn how to drive just using the dual controls. Okay, so you'll get that to the side of the road, you'll pull in when it's a nice quiet area. I'd suggest you do, do it like you train a student, take it to a quiet area and go around the block and do stopping and starting and all that sort of thing. So now you'll need to reach across the, to the steering wheel so get the person, the competent driver, to sit back a bit in the driver's seat so that you can get your hands at the steering wheel of the vehicle and from uh, in, the, in the driver's seat. And they, that can help you get an idea of how, how this can be done from the instructor's seat. So you're going to have to reach across. Now, the other thing this process teaches you is what are the limitations what can you do easily when you're intervening in a student's driving because something's going wrong? And what is going to be more difficult? Okay. And that's one of the foundation things of, of this uh, exercise. And of course, to get yourself used to the other seat, uh, driving from the other seat. So this driving from the passenger side with the dual controls is an extremely important exercise. And it develops the following competencies knowing that you can fully drive the car competently from the passenger side of the vehicle with the dual controls. Now, you can imagine how much um, I sometimes I've picked up a student and they've got into the driver's seat, for example, and I've said to them, look, um, they've said to me, oh, I'm a bit stressed about this. I, I don't really want to stay out from here and things like that. And sometimes I can second them into the idea says, look, don't worry about it. I see these pedals here, they're connected to your pedals, so I show them where it is, and it says I get at the steering wheel, and I'll show you, I'm going to drive you to a quiet place, and they're, they're in the, um, in the uh, driver's seat, and I'll drive them for a little distance and show them that you don't need to worry about having a crash, I've got control of the vehicle from this side. And matter of fact, I try to reassure them even from that point of view, that if they're going to, I says, if you crash, it could be partially my fault simply because I had the pedals there and I didn't use them. Right. So when it comes to intervention, though, in the uh, driving for safety reasons, you'll understand also the limitations of doing this with the dual controls. I'll give you an example of that. Because you're leaning across and you've only got half of the steering wheel to work with on one side of the steering wheel, turning if they go a full revolution of the wheel and trying to get that back again is going to be a problem. But that's what this exercise teaches you, what those limitations actually are. And of course, you're getting competent at the process of driving from that side. So some considerations when learning to drive with dual controls. Steer with your right hand. And when you're turning corners, turn your body and use both hands to turn the steering wheel. So like dog paddle on that side of the wheel. Uh, there have been situations where there's been a full revolution of the wheel and they're heading for the gutter. And I've literally had to reach through, wrench their hands off the wheel. In other words, put my arm through to the opposite side of the wheel and just lift their arms off the wheel to gain control in, in an emergency situation. And it, it, is, it is saved the day. So think about the stuff when you do this training. You think about the limitations you've got to work with. 
So no indications may, it, it may be possible in some situations if the indicator arm is located on the right side of the wheel at column. So it may, it may, you, so if you've got the indicators on the right, as it is for a lot of New Zealand cars, when you turn the indicator, try to get across to it, unless the, your driver sits back quite a way, it's really difficult to reach across. If you've got a European, the indicator's on that side, then you're home and host, aren't you? You can, if you get real difficulty with that, and you want to be able to gain control of the indication, you can get what is called an indicator extension. And what it is, you go to people who do disability driving, they will do, they'll make one up for you. It clamps onto your current indicator on the right side and brings an arm across the top of the tearing column and out the side. I've often been thinking of putting one of these on. For those drivers you get in the car and they've been driving European and then you want to get them to drive uh, that you've got a car on uh, with the indicator on the other side, they could be back at home again with an indicator on the other side. It's not a big modification. It's a clamp that goes around that indicator on the right-hand side. There's a little bar that comes over and comes up where the indicator would normally be on the right-hand side of the steering wheel. Could you, it also help you get at it if they fail to indicate as well. So let you know that those sort of modifications are available. They're available from, uh, if you find, look up disability um, driving assessors, uh, they'll put you onto it. That's all your occupational therapists and people like that. They'll have a person that does that sort of work in their area. So the feeling of driving from that passenger seat feels rather strange. It feels like you're driving with the pedals in front of you and you've got the steering wheel right over to the right side of the car. Now, that's a little bit weird when you first start, I can tell you. And everyone comments on it when I, when I do this exercise. But it says, keep at it. And I've got to get them to sit back in the seat, use that right hand and reach across to it and sit straight because you don't want yourself twisted around in the seat. It'll give you back problems eventually, all right? And you've got to operate the dual controls so straight out in front of you. So... To get the, the use this, and, and as you practice more, it will take you about five or more hours of driving to get used to the or get competent at this process. Some people adapt really quick to it, and I look, I've seen them adapt just in an hour. But it, give yourself a bit of practice in this and make sure that you're competent at it. And um, as I say, it's it's something I've done all my life with dual controls and, and uh, on the driving, and I train my own driving instructors in it. Uh, one thing that doesn't happen in the eye endorsement course at the moment is that you don't get this training. And I believe it's a vital part, but I understand why they don't do it. Uh, the reason they don't do it is because not all driving instructors will use dual controls. In my opinion, they should be. But never mind. That's another road to go down later on. So when you are competent at driving using the dual controls, you'll be noticing that some things are hard to do from the passenger seat with the dual controls, e.g. the indicator, we've just gone over that, doing sharp turns. So if you're doing more than one revolution of the wheel, because you've got to work the wheel from the right-hand side of the, uh, sorry, left-hand side of the steering wheel, you've got to like dog paddle it up or dog paddle it down on with the, like a hand over hand steering. So that takes a little bit of getting used to because you may need to limit the speed of the car to be able to turn the wheel fast enough. And it's one of the problem areas you can get when the students are going quick around the corner and oversteer. Uh, it's, it's a hard one to correct that. It's generally a combination of brake plus pushing the wheel correct. It's important that you take note of these things that are, that are difficult to do while you're trying to drive the vehicle from that left-hand side. And um, so when your students actually make those errors, uh, with with the control with the controls of the vehicle, you'll know how much you can compensate from your side. Right. That will make more sense when you do it. Now, some instructors out there would have done a lot of this sort of work um, and use them a lot and things like that. And um, you know, this uh, it's really for the new guys on the block. If you've got a, a you're new to driving, instructing, and dual controls, this stuff. All right. So the next step towards knowing how to use your dual controls is to get your driver to do inappropriate inputs to the pedals and the and the steering of the vehicle, okay? And including the indicators. 
Like I said, they indicate the wrong way. Hey, the indicator's way over there. You're probably not going to be doing anything about it. You know what I mean? You're probably going to be trying to avoid the crash where the false indication confused another driver, for example. So that's the next thing to do. So you'll be driving down the road, get the, get the driver to start to wander the car over towards the gutter and get used to putting your hand on that wheel and correcting it. You know what I mean? Now, it's sort of a, a little note here that um, don't uh, avoid physical contact with the students. In other words, don't go doing things like if they're not steering the car right, put your hand on their hands or, or physically touch them in any way. There's been a lot of problems in the industry over the years. And so you've got to keep your hands to your damn self. And if I need to intervene with the wheel, I'll usually put my hand under their hands on that bit that's free and push it up or pull over the top and grab over the top. So you don't need to, um, um, you know, and, you know, in years gone by, there's been inappropriate instructors over the 40 years I've, I've known, um, been in this industry. Some instructors are using inappropriate um, physical intervention. Try to avoid the physical intervention altogether, just grip, unless it's with the controls of the vehicle. So, um, and how to use the dual controls in steering so, and to rectify the different wrong, so the problem is that the students put wrong inputs in on the, like too much gas, too little gas, too much brake, too little, little brake, uh, too little brake, uh, and so with the clutch and the gears and things like that. So, Steering errors can usually be corrected by pulling or pushing of the steering wheel away from the hazard. Note that your dual driving exercise that you did earlier, you will now know that in sudden situations, you'll only be able to react with half a turn of the steering wheel. So using the dual brake as well in that situation may mean the difference between hitting the curb, for example, or... Um, pulling get pulling them out of the way of an oncoming vehicle or things like that. So you're only going to get half a turn of the wheel in a sudden emergency. You'll be able to push on that wheel and push it half a turn one way or the other. Right. So yeah, I, as I say, this is stuff you've got to learn. You've got to get someone to do some mistakes. Now be careful <laughs> while you're doing this. Because if you drive, your, your driver gets too exuberant on it, start gentle and work it up to a point where you can learn where those limitations actually are. Okay. Now, too much gas. So this time the students actually put their foot uh, on the dual, uh, 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 put the gas pedal and they're frozen with their foot on the floor. Now, remember, first intervention is verbal. Foot off the gas or whatever words you want to use for that. If it's too late for that, or it's uh, the situation's developing too quickly, then the normal thing to do with that is to put your foot on the brake, the dual brake, and drag the engine down. Now, be careful here. Um, so, with the man in the manual cars years ago, we couldn't push the clutch in because the engine would over rev. Um, just check out with your. Um, Manual to, uh, most modern cars now have got what they call rev limiters on their motors. So they'll go up to the red line and they won't go any faster than that in the motor. It'll, it, it's got a cutout system on it and stops it going any faster. You, you and, and if you've got a modern car, you, you can tell that by, dare I say, to go somewhere quiet because someone think you're being an idiot. You just put your foot on the gas, keep pushing it down slowly. And when it gets to the red line, see if it will go past the red line, which it generally won't. It'll just, it'll just hold there and it won't go any further. So too much gas. So the floor of the gas, now remember, they, you can say foot off the gas, okay? But that's fine. But remember, if they're, um, you've got the fight or flight mode when people come under stress, and then you can be saying foot off the gas and it's not going to come off because they're frozen there. So you've got to think, well, what am I going to do? So some instructors have a kill switch put on the vehicle, which they can hit it, and it cuts the motor. Um, I, I would suggest, I've never used a kill switch on any of my vehicles, but I know if I put my foot on the brake, and if it's, then make sure your brake pedal's good enough for this too, the dual brake, and you put your foot on the brake and you can literally just slow the car down and kind of stop it. Now, some other things to think about here, you've got a, you've got a manual car with a clutch. 
Um, Jenny, if you um, you push the clutch in, what will happen is the motor will just rev right up. If you've got time, just push down the brake and stall it out. You know what I mean? Uh, is a, a way you can do that. Or until they, in other words, sometimes you can just slow it down enough with the brake and they'll actually, they'll hear you then and, they think, and they've, they've snapped out of it and they'll take their foot off the uh, the gas. Now be extremely careful of this stuff when you're training new people, eh? It's, it's highly dangerous. And you might say, well, I wouldn't take them in that sort of environment. Look, it can happen in the simple environments. I've had people freeze on the controls. We had one instructor, um, they put their foot on the gas, uh, the student put the foot on the gas pedal. Before the instructor could bring it under control, they'd gone through a fence and into a house. You know, it does happen. I've seen one in the root newspapers recently that, that happened in Nelson, um, uh, where the instructor, um, somehow the car ended up through the fence and things like that. So uh, they do happen. I suggest to you that if you find that you that with going for the dual brake and it's not pulling the car up quick enough, hit the um, gear shift selector, hit it into neutral. If you bang up a gear shift selector on an automatic car, it will go straight up into neutral. And the engine will rev up. But if it's got a rev limiter on it, then you've saved the day, haven't you? Because sometimes while the engine's pulling forward and you would only push the clutch in to alleviate the situation, uh, it may not slow down enough. So there's another, there's all sorts of interventions in here and you'll work these out as you go. And they can be different from the, ma the manual to the automatic. So with the automatic car, Jenny, electric car, I'm, I'm just taking it from the hybrid vehicle I've got. If you put your foot on the brake, it will automatically cut the motor out on this particular, this particular hybrid. So people have got in the car, it's been in neutral, and they've put their foot flat on the accelerator, it's been on, and because it's on the electric motor, but it doesn't rev up. It's quite a good safety feature. So check all these kind of things out. Or, you know, what's going to be your best method of intervention if they floor the accelerator, right? And so uh, this is the day and the age, as I say, in the motor vehicles where we do have rev limiters. So um, you can push the clutch in. If you don't like the revving up of the motor, just put your foot on the brake and drag the engine speed down with, you know, braking it and things like that, even if you've got to bring it down to the point where it stalls. And if you have control back again. So think about your gas pedal. There's a one wrong input. We've gone over the steering. Um, so students don't need to push the clutch and remember to uh, to change gear. So um, so if they don't push the clutch in when they're changing gear, then you just do it with the dual clutch. And you get that. They're, they're pushing away at the gear lever, trying to get the gear in. You can clearly, if you're following through, I often, with the manual, you can leave the light weight of your feet on the pedal, especially on the clutch. They don't even know you've got your foot on it. You actually feel that, no, you haven't pushed the clutch right down. You can just stamp it down and the gear will go straight in. So there's interventions like that that you can do as well. All right, so with the clutch, they're not pushing it in. That's one intervention you need to think about. And so they need to... Um, you can push it in on the dual clutch side. All right, student doesn't break enough and just um, or just add more pressure, obviously, to the brake pedal to compensate. That's what you need to do. So they're coming up and you're saying uh, brake or your, whatever your verbal intervention is going to be. So go to your LSFDI, look at those interventions and things like that and make sure that you understand what to say to them. Like, Jenny, don't say accelerate. You Jenny say gas because accelerator and indicator, uh, sorry, accelerator and um, uh, accelerator and gas are, are different because a, the uh, yeah accelerator and indicator sound the same. So you you need to just make sure the words are quite different. So, so gas on, gas off, and things like that. Right. So you got your dual brake there to compensate. Uh, make sure it's a, a good one. And uh, Jenny, with a lot of the dual controls now, they're pretty good. They'll actually even lock up the wheels on, on the instructor's side, so you've got full control. Um, there are situations where dual controls can cause overreaction to some driving situations. 
that can be dangerous. And one of those most common of these, and it's written in the LSFDI, is that the student breaks and you're breaking with the dual break, which causes over-breaking. Right, so you've both gone for it and they can feel it's going down and they're trying to put pressure from their side and you get it, it gets all confused. And so as a result of that, you have the most common type of crash in a driving school car is a rear end collision because of this factor here of over braking. Right. So you'd be gonna be you, you get used to it after a while. You get you, you exactly know that how to intervene with the situation uh with that. But I've got to say. We'd had over the years, we've had more people running into the back of us. And some instructors say, well, that's not so bad, is it? Because they're legally liable. That's not the point. The point of the matter is your car is off the road eight weeks getting repaired and you've got no damn income. So think about, you know, that you don't want to be, um, if they're panicking with all these controls or they're, they're misusing them badly, keep the driving situation simple. Don't go into complex traffic keep away from it until they're fairly proficient. Especially, I, I go to, especially with this one, to the manual car. I reckon it takes a, at least a third longer to learn to drive a manual car than, than you would an automatic car. So, you know, it's going to take them a lot longer to get the clutch and, and all those sort of things worked out as they go. Right, so you can try to alert the, uh, to, uh, you to the situation and using dual controls, but the best way is to learn from experience. So um, you need to go out there and do the stuff, and you need to do it without the students in the car to start with. You need that competent driver beside you. So well, let's have a look at this table on the next slide and see what sort of ways you could react with dual controls. So, okay, so here's your, your, your situation. You can see it pretty much follows all of the control inputs in the vehicle. So the most important part, uh, most appropriate dual control intervention, and what do you, you need to do to um, be, be aware of in the following situation? So steering too far to the left or right, or not straightening up the steering wheel soon enough on sharp turns is a really common steering wheel intervention. Too much gas uh, or not enough gas, is obvious with those are two extremities, or too much brake or not enough brake. Remember this, the, the gas pedal is not, I find is not so bad, but the brake is, there's, when you push the gas on, the systems in the vehicle will take care of it if you brake and things like that. But with the brake, pushing on too much brake, you can't put your foot under the dual pedal and lift it up. It, 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 the brake that's on is on and there's nothing you can do about it in many ways. It's what makes that rear end collision so common. Clutch, not let, letting the clutch out or not pushing the clutch in enough. And when the gear changing is a really common one here. And you can even use the dual controls. I was talking to you about the, to help them find the uh, the connecting point of the clutch, friction point, whatever words you want to use for it. Um, they're extremely good for that. So, and while stopping and starting, you know, is, is okay. they don't push the clutch right in and you can just push and remember, clutch to the floor into first gear. You know what I mean? So um, think about your commands. And instructors have been teaching for a while where well, this will be kind of automatic in you. Indicators not signaling or signaling in the wrong direction. Uh, they, some of the more common ones there. All right, let's have a look at where we're going with this now. So in summary now, make sure that you're totally confident with using your dual controls to drive the car from the passenger side of the vehicle. Right? Get the, drive, the, the driver and the student of the vehicle to simulate. So you've got your driver there, you've got your, your student is the, um, you're probably you at this case, and get them to simulate steering inputs that are wrong. In other words, turn too far to the left. Have a go at this one. Go around a 90 degree turn where you'll have to turn the steering wheel about a complete revolution of the wheel. And this is a really, some of the ones I can speak to you about, some of the ones over the years I've had where I haven't quite managed to get the wheel straight. So big left turn coming around and then they accelerate. And before they, they hit, you can imagine they're not straightening up the wheel and you're heading towards the gutter. 
if you don't get onto that brake and get that wheel away, and you may not even be able to retrieve it at that level either, and you can end up going into the curb, and it usually blows your left front tire, and it can bugger up the left front suspension, which uh, one day I was coming up, we we're coming up to an intersection, and we we're going to do a left turn, but I gave the command in the wrong order. And this is why it's important that when you give the students um, commands and things like that to what you want them to do, that you do them in the correct order. And so if you go through the in the LSFDI, it talks a bit about the stuff. You always identify where you want the manoeuvre to occur, and then you tell them what the manoeuvre is. For example, at the next intersection, turn left, right? So always identify where you want it done. So what happened on this day, there was, um, we're driving up, and I, I gave the command in the wrong order. I said, to, uh, before I could say uh, at the next intersection, I just said, turn left. And I was going to say at the next intersection, they turned immediately left. I tried to correct it, but that that particular day resulted in uh, bending the left front suspension of the vehicle. So as I say, I've been around long enough to know what sort of things happen? I don't mind admitting them to you as well, because they are very real danger out there. And it's not the student's fault. A lot of the time you'll find that you've misread it yourself or things like that. Um, so get them to put the wrong pedal inputs and the wrong steering inputs in and know that how much from your training when you drove the car from the left side, how easy it's going to be to correct that. What is the appropriate correction? What pedal to use? And it's not always the same pedal. You've got the gas on and they've got the gas flat to the floor. You might be onto the brake. You know what I mean? So if the clutch is not down enough, a lot of the time it is the same element, but sometimes it may be another one, either the gas or the brake or the clutch to where that actually, yeah, uh, what's appropriate. Uh, remember, if verbal intervention doesn't happen, use your dual controls and keep everyone safe. I'm talking about the public out there. I'm talking about your students. I'm talking about you, and I'm talking about your vehicle. So I'm hoping with them um, tonight, with them um, just sharing some of that stuff with you, that you'll get an appreciation that when you become a new driving instructor, that you'll go out and do this exercise. And as I say, um, I'll just touch on one other point. I'll come back on the slide here so, so the screen's not blank for you. I'll touch on one other thing called dual driving. Now, dual driving is where you, I start all students that never haven't got any clue about driving. I do the pedals they do the steering and I can intervene with the steering because I've done the dual driving exercise. I know how far they can go and what amount of intervention I, I would have available to me. That's why that exercise before was so important to you. So I know then, so they get to steer the car. Then I, I stage it through. They then get the gas pedal and then they get the brake. Then they got the, that's the functions of an automatic, isn't it? right? Then they get the clutch if it's a manual, and then they get the gears. They don't get to do the whole lot. I've always done it that way, and I find it super, super good. But the problem is that when you've got three pedals on the floor, you have to be able to, and I learned this um, procedure from flying. When you learn to fly a light aircraft, there's there's procedures they use to make sure that you, your student does things, um, and you know who's got control. So, when the dual driving with the manual car, which is not very often these days, we get a lot of that work, but we're driving up and I'll say, right here, we're going to now use the gas pedal. So we're going to dual drive this. So I'll get them to sit at the side of the road. They've got the steering. They've been around um, a lot of the coastline here where I, where I train for that, where it's nice and quiet. And they've got the steering now. Steering to me takes around about one hour on most people before I'll introduce the pedal. So I've known people to take five hours. They, it's For some people, it's just a, a not an easy thing to do. So don't be too stressed if they're still just, you're doing the pedals and they're still just driving with the steering wheel. 
They need to be able to proficiently drive. Now, what will happen the moment you introduce the gas pedal and you introduce the brake or the clutch or the other pedals on the floor, the steering immediately goes out of control. So be ready for it. The reason that happens is because their mind has just moved down to their feet. So um, you can simplify this process, but um, even more. So this is what I meant about dual controls and how to simplify what the how complicated it is for them to drive at the time. Now, some instructors will go to a car park, they'll do stop starting, stop starting, and they'll get them all used to it and then bring them out on the road. I leave them on the road. Uh, they, 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 they do everything on the road. So they'll go into, um, they'll do th that, and then I'll give them the gas pedal and said, okay, and I use the command, gas on. And sometimes I'm talking about what I'm doing with my feet so that they are getting that idea as well. So gas on, gas off. Then it's brake, more brake, get brake off, as some of the commands you use there. And so you can get, get them actually driving. A lot of the time with the automatic, you can introduce the gas and the brake all in one it's not that complicated to do you've got a go pedal and a stop pedal basically haven't you so um with the uh manual though it is quite complicated and we used to do a thing called dual driving and they would get the they get the functions of the automatic car and i would be so when i needed them to bring the gas off i would say right i'm going to change gear i want to take the gas off and you'd have to wait for them to take the gas off acknowledge i'd push the clutch in, change the gear i bring the clutch out and I put the gear uh, uh, change the gear and put the clutch out and they said now gas on all right gas off gas on you know then it was they had the brake function and then you can bring in the clutch and then you've got to get those feet going <laughs> one up one down and then they get all complicated with that but you see with a full set of dual controls how simple you could step that across i step it across from the right hand side of the car accelerator then the brake then the clutch then the gears some instructors won't break it down that much. Some people don't need it breaking down that much. They can handle it a little better. But if you want to, let you know that you can break it down that much for the, your students and make it really easy for them to actually pick up this process and drive. So that's what I want to share with you tonight. So um, I'll put this up onto the site and you guys that missed it tonight, feel free to um, have a little look at it. And it's a bit thing I've been wanting to share for a long time. People have sent me um, uh, text messages, things like that, to say, um, who teaches dual control training in the country? Well, we should, the fact of the matter is we should all learn it. That's my opinion. Um, most instructors that have gone through with me and they've, they've gone out and they've um, been driving and they've said, I didn't think that the students would do that. And I says, I'm glad you gave me that training because I reacted absolutely appropriately. So that's why a few hours of it. Get your driver, your competent driver, to do things like don't bring the clutch out and rev the motor up. And work out what you're going to do about that. Uh, get, get them to put too much brake on. See what you can do about that. You know what I mean? Get them to do wrong inputs with every pedal, not enough, too much and things like that, and all the controls, and make sure that you are thoroughly familiarised with how to take the appropriate action. And then, you know, the, if they say to you, did you do anything towards health and safety in relationship to your dual controls and getting these, um, having dual controls in the car and doing this training has uh, hugely, we hardly ever have any um, insurance claims, but if we do have them, um, in some ways, I've got to be asking the instructor, why didn't you intervene early enough? Now, there is the odd occasion, I will say, and I've had them. <laughs> so I can't, I can't let you guys be thinking here that um, somehow that's some sort of miracle cure. It's not, but it's definitely, you know, it would avert 80 to 90% of the um, stressed situations you get for the students and, and the near misses. All right, so I'll leave you with that and we'll uh, catch you now if you uh, do view this next week's ones. Uh, we're going to look at what to do if you've got your, a new student for the first time. In other words, you don't know much about their driving, etc. So I look forward to that one next week and um, it's a good night from me.